Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Welcome everyone for the uh, yet another episode of Monks Podcast. We have uh, two fantastic wise people with us, uh, Shamananda and Chaitanya Charan. And today is something very interesting topic, seeing the corona outbreak, which is around. Um, it's in uh, everybody's minds and on everybody's uh, lips. They're talking about it everywhere. And we want to see how the principle of karma relates to this outbreak, the nuances and the questions around it. So I would like to begin with questions to both of you. If you can also describe in brief about the karma principle and uh, are there any connections with, with uh, what the world is facing at such a massive scale? Uh, could it be just that everybody is collectively getting uh, karma designed by some intelligent entity whom we can just, you know, just causally link to in some inferential way? So, yeah, I would, I would like to ask both of you. Okay. So, yeah, it's... Uh... Difficult question, whenever there is, there are wrongs, there are sufferings for which we don't have any immediate causal explanation, it becomes difficult for us humans to understand what the cause is. I would like to start firstly by stressing that the Bhagavad Gita in almost all its uh, references to karma uses the word karma in a particular sense. It's important whenever we use words to understand what, what is the meaning, because words are multivalent. And I may use the word with one meaning, you might have another meaning in mind. So broadly, we can say that the word karma has <clears throat> four or five meanings. First meaning of karma is action. Do some karma. Second is uh, reaction. I am suffering my karma. So, so third is that one particular kind of karma that is good karma. That that we sometimes call it as there are there are three kinds of karma. There is su karma, there is bi karma, and there is a karma. So su karma is shorter form is put in short as karma. That is good karma. So mm -hmm. one is simply referring to action. The second is referring to reaction. Third is to referring to good action. That means action which will give us good reactions. Fourth is it refers to the system of action reaction. That the law of karma. And the fifth is uh, in the sense of karma itself as dharma, as duty. Not just we have to do some action, but we have to do act in a responsible way. So, for example, when Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita says, Karmanne Vadeka Raste Mafaleshu you have a right to do your duty. And so, basically, the word karma has different senses. And in general, the Bhagavad Gita's stress is on karma in the last sense as dharma. What is the right thing for us to do? The Bhagavad Gita doesn't get so much into karma in the sense of somebody getting the reactions for their actions. So for example, the Bhagavad Gita is about is spoken uh, after the <clears throat> after the Pandavas have gone through a lot of sufferings and it doesn't address so much what is the cause of their suffering. It doesn't speak that you know, they have caused all the sufferings to you and therefore you have to get back at them. So the idea is that this understanding of karma, that it is we choose the right course of action for ourselves. Mm -hmm. That is a much more empowering and uh, non-judgmental approach to the subject of karma. So broadly speaking, if we consider simply karma, 
as cause effect correlation or cause effect connection that action causes have effects and if effects are present they must have had some causes early so if we broadly accept this principle then in the present what it means for us is if we do the right if we do the right thing now we will be able to create right results for ourselves in the future so the bhagavad gita uses karma more in a sense of present and future rather than past and present it's not you did this because you are getting this but rather what should you do now so that you can create the brightest future for yourself so karma seen in this way is not so much uh, about diagnosing the past as it is about creating the future so we all if we consider karma simply in this causal cause effect connection none of us live as if there is no uh, there is no cause effect connection there are certain levels at which we can't find out cause effect connection so now when the corona pandemic is spreading across the world we do accept there is a cause effect connection that well that's why if you stay in t- if you get too close to people then you'll get infected so have social distancing and if somebody is getting infected we want to check what is the cause is it because of say somebody who has come from abroad somebody has come from a place where they were then or is it because of is it is it community spreading or is it just local spreading right now which stage is it at so cause effect analysis is universal and we cannot function in life without doing some cause effect analysis so karma if we see that simply as a cause effect analysis then it's it's an extension of the of the mode of thinking that we all have in our day to day lives and if we consider that in terms of what causes can i initiate now by which the effects will be what i would like to have in the future and karma can be seen as a very a positive purposeful and empowering way of looking at the world Shaman, you want to add something? Uh, I just found this interesting passage, and uh, as you rightly said, we need to look at things from how they can empower us, rather than uh, how they can confuse us or make us weak. So this is uh, ninth chapter, the ninth verse. and yeah. krishna is making his position vis-a-vis with the material world and he uses a very surgically precise language i am ever detached from all these material activities seated as though neutral and uh, the bhakti vedanta purport says like material activities are carried out by the different potencies of which the material potency is one potency and i am taking this link that when somebody says this is karma or in daily parlance we say this is the law hmm. so obviously law presupposes a law given so if it says uh, no parking no left turn no right turn it means there is a agency and there is a guarantor behind that agency who sees to it that this law is obeyed so i'm just uh, focusing on this particular thing which somebody might say that is god angry with us is is he giving retribution is he exacting a vengeance upon us maybe we put too much time into developing social media we did we 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 utilize our time into building skyscrapers or uh, utilizing our time for football world cups or cricket world cups and 
he's not happy with this and therefore there is a this is a punishment so it says here that the lord is always neutral and uh, neutral doesn't mean disinterested and the example given is very appropriate a high court judge sitting on the bench can order so many things happening somebody is being punished somebody is being rewarded but still he is seen as neutral but funnily even in a newspaper an item would come that the judge awarded him punitive damages and the person who is getting say time in jail he may look at a particular magistrate and say he gave me 6 months in jail now in one sense he is not your personal enemy that he has he doesn't like your face therefore he has put you in jail you have done something which is part of the the ecosystem and you going to jail is a part of the ecosystem and this authority has just approved it so approving somebody to be punished and telling him that i don't like your face therefore i'm punishing you these are two different things so if at all there is a karma in charge and he or she has decided that 2020 is the year in which i am going to show man or humanity what power we have or what what i can unleash and uh, certainly to see the uss theodore roosevelt uh, such a big aircraft carrier with missiles which can obliterate uh, huge swathes of country or flatten a whole city and now they are at the mercy of something which they can't even see and the the commander of such a aircraft carrier is practically uh, requesting that let me allow to disembark let me allow we have people who are going the number of positive cases of corona is increasing the fear factor has become very prevalent and taking a cue from what chetan charan said that rather than the past and present if the understanding of karma has to take us from the present to the future as rightly said we need to wash our hands for 20 seconds we need to socially distance ourselves we need to um, maintain isolation and at the same time if we ponder for a moment as to number 1 that's not a like a uh, it would be a major detour from our topic as to how everything is so fragile here but the second point is more important as to is this reaction like your um, first second third fourth fourth definition of karma is action and reaction so if this pandemic can be considered a reaction what could be a, a remedial action and that also is part of karma i would like if you want to have some more discussion on this that like what could be the remedial action so thank mm. you uh, chetan charan shamananda uh, for this uh, very nice view points so i think when we are standing at this particular pedestal in this um, part of the uh, whole spatio temporal um, landscape in 2020 in a particular place here and now of course we are at zoom karma card as chetana charan prabhu said that it allows us to look what we can do in the future rather brood about the past but you mentioned uh, shamananda that it also allows us to see whether we have gone wrong i think both of them should go hand in hand um perhaps we cannot you know 
to banish somebody just with the karma card saying that, okay, you know, you are doomed. You did something bad and uh, maybe the reaction is coming to you uh, and you have to just face it or suffer it. And I believe none of the um, priests or those with some theological stand uh, stands are saying like this. Everybody is concerned about this issue today. And at, and similarly, I think we cannot just relegate ourselves to just having discussion on now what do we do? Let's do social distancing. Let's get over this problem because then we may not we may not get wiser. We this again this issue will come and we may not ponder back that maybe some of our choices have gone wrong. Okay, so so this was my point that. Um, and maybe you would want to share, and this is what Shamananda also suggested, that they have to go in together holistically. So these are the two factors to go it, go holistically. And let me add a 0.5 factor also, so 2.5. And that is, which I think Shamananda alluded, is there may be certain things which are just the part of design. We can get over this pandemic and... Uh, we can get over um, maybe other such troubles which may be hurled towards us, but just the part of the design is, um, it's a complex world. So we'll keep facing many of these issues. So how do we add that 0.5 factor also in the equation and does karma has to say something about it? Uh, that, does Krishna say something related to this in Bhagavad Gita? So some thing to discuss if you'd like. Can I begin? Uh, Please. Yeah, since uh, you mentioned this thing that is there something in the design and uh, I was uh, quite uh, intrigued to use a, I mean, not having a better word, or maybe curious that there is a branch of science now called paleo, paleo virology. That means the study of virus as whether there is a fossilized virus anywhere. Okay. Whether whether they they were existing with humans or whatever Homo, whatever we were there before Homo sapiens came, or even the Neanderthals or the Australopithecus, did they have any kind of viral infections? So first of all even the best explanations about what a virus is, they, they try to tread a very thin line. And uh, in one very interesting and very scientifically presented video on YouTube, the YouTube community likes to comment sometimes, uh, not sometimes, many times the comments are more interesting than the stuff up there. So here is one viewer asking, so what did he say? Is the virus alive or it is not a living being? And another person answers, he said, he answered it. The answer is, yesn't. Y-A-S-N apostrophe T. It begins with yes and ends with doesn't, the last part of doesn't. So they say it is inactive as much as it is outside somewhere. And once it goes inside, it becomes active. Now that itself is like a big, uh, steep learning curve for a common man today. I belong to the common fraternity. I don't claim to have any kind of extra genius to understand. So if this is part of the design, as uh, Harivamsha you said, then just a very crude example, I buy a product let's say a gadget and the manufacturer says there are no user serviceable parts inside. That means please don't tinker with this. Or sometimes it says warranty void if this seal is broken. So is there something like this which is part of the universal design and maybe in humanity's curiosity for achieving more commercial power, 
or some more dollars? Have we broken a seal somewhere? Have we tinkered with some non-user serviceable parts? And then the warranty of this earthly planet, the product which we didn't pay for at all has been given to us. And now we see a whole set of reaction, which as Harivan just said, if the, if the whole thing is part of the design, then the reaction also is a part of the design. So there is nothing like somebody is cruel, somebody is blind, somebody is vindictive and is jealous of our progress. Mm. It is just that we have broken something and we need to fix it. So among the things which we need to fix is number one, our use of fossil fuels, our use of uh, animal flesh, especially factory farmed animals as the sole source of protein, the understanding that do we need so much of protein, do we need so much of uh, industrialization? These are some very difficult issues to handle, but this, this is something which I would like to focus on. Maybe you can take this point or you have something different to add, Chaitanya Charan. A lot of points there, a lot of points there. Okay. Uh, let me take them one by one. First is with respect to the design. This is a this is where there's a significant difference between karma and cause effect as is understood within science, specifically physics. Often the law of karma is compared to the third law of motion. That to every action there is a equal and opposite reaction. So now that is true. So there is a there is a mechanical process of action reaction, and there is a moral dimension to action reaction. So that there is a mechanical process of action reaction is something which is not only accepted by science; it is central to science. If there were no there were no predictable correlation between causes and effects, between action and reactions, we would not be able to have science at all. Science functions on inductive reasoning, which involves us doing a number of experiments and observing the results. And then we generalize, and this is how the results have come out, that is how they will come out in the future also. So that means uh, in inductive reasoning, the, its cause effect correlation is foundational. So no cause effect correlation would be no science. A science accepts cause effect correlation in a functional sense, not in a moral sense, functional or mechanical sense. You could say. If you put this acid in this base, you will have a, you will have a salt. You put these two chemicals together, this will explode, whatever. So <clears throat> where people start uh, feeling uh, alienated or apprehensive is when the focus shifts from the moral from the mechanical or functional aspect of action which in call it action reaction correlation to the moral aspect and uh, regarding how you started by saying that is there something which we need to learn we might not learn that if we focus on only on fixing things Yes, that's true. So I would like to give an example here. So if a doctor is treating a patient and the patient has <clears throat> is severely sick, maybe having some liver problems because of excessive alcoholism. Now, at that time when the patient is in severe pain, the primary purpose of the doctor, the primary focus of the doctor has to be on treating the pain. At that time, if the star, doctor starts giving a, lecture, a, dis, a discourse, you fool, I told you, don't drink. Why did you drink? That would be inappropriate. The doctor says, if I, if you don't, uh, I, you, I have told you so many times, you didn't stop drinking, I'm not going to treat you. That is also not proper. So, the focus of the doctor 
on treating the patient. At the same time, as a part of helping the patient heal, the doctor also needs to give that knowledge or give the stress. Now, I can treat and fix things now, but if you're going to keep drinking, mm -hmm. this is going to recur and it may worsen also. Mm -hmm. so, there, so there is, uh, the, if the thrust of the doctor is only on condemning the wrong behavior, without correcting, without helping correct the consequences of that wrong behavior, then the doctor uh, will seem judgmental. Mm -hmm. So, but if the doctor only focuses on correcting the consequences of the wrong behavior and doesn't speak one word about the alcoholism which caused it, thinking, oh, this person may get angry with me, this person will, uh, will get upset with me, I'll not speak it, then that is being sentimental. So I would say we have to, if we consider a pendulum, we have to avoid both extremes. Mm -hmm. Sentiment, being sentimental and not speak about the improper actions, especially the improper moral choices that may be leading to this thing. At the same time, we don't want to become judgmental and not help in fixing things. So we need to we need to make it clear ourselves, not just by our words, but also by our actions, that we are here to help solve the problem. We are not here to judge anyone. But as a part of solving, certain judgments may be useful. They may even be essential. Mm -hmm. So then once, uh, once that is clear that the thrust is to help, then the judgments can be made in a, uh, in a way that won't come off as judgmental. So that was about learning lessons. And as far as going further to the point of, is God, uh, is God angry with us? Now, broadly, there have been, if you consider the history of modern Western thought, or Western thought, the conception of God, especially in terms of his interaction with the world, has grown through three broad stages. Traditionally, whether in the East or the West, the idea was theism. Theism means that God is the creator and God is the controller. Then there it, it became next was deism. Deism is God is the creator, but not the controller. It's like a, a watch or a clock. The clock definitely had a designer, but the uh, the designer of the clock has no control over it now. It's just functioning as according to the structure and the system that were created. And then, uh, now the idea has largely become atheism, where there is no creator nor any controller. So if we consider, broadly speaking, the Gita's perspective of God. The Gita's perspective of God, there is a multi-level conception of divinity. There is an all-pervading conception of divinity, which is called as Brahman or Brahma Jyoti. There is a localized conception of God in the heart, who is the overseer, the witness, that is the Paramatma, the super soul as it's called. And then there is the transcendental conception of divinity, that is Bhagavan who exists beyond this world in who, who talks about the self-existence of God in his own abode. So God has created this world in a way that it does not require his constant intervention. That means actions produce reactions. And God is not personally involved in judging people and giving them the consequences of that. Say, for example, if somebody steps down from a 10-story building and they crash and they break their uh, limbs, well, it is not that God caused the breaking of the limbs. It is, it is a law of gravity. Now, we could say the law of gravity is made by God. If we accept either a deistic or a theistic worldview, but still, it's not that God is causing it. So similarly, at this, uh, when you talk about God, it is not that God personally judges people and has an agenda against them. The world is created as a 
at one level a self sufficient functional system om purnamadha purnamidam purnat purnamudachyate purnasya purnamadaya purnameva avashishyate so the distresses of the world so the world is complete in itself that means the world is a system which world is made in such a way that it operates according to its own principles at the bhagavad gita talks about these two levels maya adhyakshena prakriti suvyate sacharacharan hetu nanena kaunteya jagati parivartate so god is overseen but hetu anenena the the cause of the changes in this world is material nature is not god itself so it's not that god is personally against anyone so when we are looking at the law of karma we have to be very clear that it is not that god is angry with the world and god is personally causing suffering to it suffering upon anyone it is that there is a system and in that system if some people do something which is going to produce certain the reactions those reactions come up. and they uh, there is god is involved not so much as the cause of the suffering but as the cure for the suffering he is there to give us the wisdom and the strength to face challenges and go through those challenges we see this in the bhagavad gita where krishna is standing is with arjuna fighting the war with him although arjuna is doing the main action krishna is with him krishna is not up high in the sky judging arjuna krishna is with arjuna and krishna is helping him fight so god we need to see god as a power as a cure for the world's problems not as the cause of the world's problems yeah i'd like to add one interesting thing which i asked a friend yesterday a trained diabetologist i said why it is said that uh, people with pre existing conditions are specifically high risk people so he said well diabetic is debilitating it decreases your immunity and then when you get this kind of thing then it exacerbates the situation and uh, it could be fatal so just another angle struck me that it's possible that these so called living plus non living at the same time kind of things not only are they existing from a very long time they are there and they don't have this kind of power to cause harm just a thought i would i'm not a medically trained person so i don't know the whole science behind it but i just asked him does it mean that right now now this was 8:45 at night right now in my body this this particular your own universe of mind which i call me my own uh, my own vehicle does it have or this is my own apartment i am the main person i pay the rent but is it possible that there are millions of other tenants in it and he said quite possible so we are all moving eating sleeping meeting defending organisms we are the this is my body so i identify with the body but i am not the only one living in it there are millions of others living and due to my choices when my immunity comes down the the power of these uh, organisms or whatever you call them comes up and uh, uh, i would like to bring it to a very uh, something close to my heart uh, the eighth canto describes how there are indra and other empowered administrative personalities acting on behalf of the cosmos they are cooperators and the asuras ravana hiranyaksha hiranyakashipu they are the opposite party they are the anti social elements so to say when does the power of the anti social elements when does it increase it depends upon the power of the demigods decreasing the power of demigods depends on uh, sattva guna so there is a like a small fuse but it lights up a huge conflagration 
Indra insults his own spiritual master. That pride causes Satvaguna to come down. Vrihaspati, who is the spiritual master, notes that now it is time for everything to go down. At that very moment, Shukracharya, the guide and spiritual teacher or guide and uh, martial teacher of the other party, he says, this is the time to perform sacrifices, perform tapasya, whatever, because now they are weak, so we are strong. So what about this angle? That this, this virus has not been made strong today. It is what it is. It is aggressive. It has this propensity of going into our respiratory tract and staying in the lungs cavities. But because of our lifestyle choices, we have actually gone down. The moment we come up to a certain level of immunity, they may stay, they may come, but they may not be this kind of aggressive or this kind of pandemic. Just a thought. Yeah, that's a very interesting thought. Uh, firstly, regarding your point about uh, other beings present within us, it's according to biology, there are 100 trillion microbes present in the average human body. <laughs> 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 so these are the non-paying these are the non-paying tenants in my body okay <laughs> they are non-paying tenants and there are how many the earth's population is about 8 billion <laughs> so it's almost 120 times the whole earth's population is present inside my body so they <laughs> eat exactly what I eat they partake of everything what I do is that so <laughs> yeah it is. <laughs> so they have their own system of nutrition and uh, some of them are good, some of them are bad, but some, uh, some play both roles in different ways. Mm -hmm. So basically, there is certainly this point that when we have low immunity, uh, the forces hostile to us will take advantage of that. The Bhagavatam also talks about this principle of constant competition, jivo jivasya jivanam, that one living being is prey for another living being. And that is just the nature of material existence. So in some ways, Darwin got it right when he said there is a constant struggle for existence. Probably at that time, microbes were not as clearly understood as they're understood now, uh, at least to that same extent. But uh, with respect to the coronavirus, that's the part of the, that we will develop some herd immunity uh, over a period of time. That's the hope for the cure. So there is, uh, there is this tension between the, the forces that are, that are defending us, the forces that are attacking us. So certainly coronavirus is, uh, is the genetic mutation which uh, was not present in the past. So the specific uh, pathogen, the specific germ, the specific virus coming to us is new. But the principle that there is a struggle is constant. And if we strengthen ourselves, then yes, we may be, we will be less vulnerable. But the world is such that when new dangers come, we find solutions to new dangers and some new dangers come further and we find solutions to those dangers. And that's how we move forward. So we could place the what happens in our lives in various causal contexts. So it's uh, increasingly broader causal context. So for example, if right now, uh, when I'm speaking, you stop hearing the audio. And that could be because maybe I press the mute button so it's uh, yes, there are some some people who are hypochondriacs. A classic definition of a hypochondriac, a person who imagines they are sick, is a person sits on the remote and presses the accidentally presses the silent button, and then they're watching TV and they think, "Oh my God, I have gone deaf." <laughs> <laughs> So, so what has happened is 
that okay the sound is the volume is the, the sound is the action is going on on the tv but i was not able to hear i was so gone deaf so the idea is when we we place events in certain causal contexts so and we can make a lot of mess of things if you place thing place things in the wrong causal contexts uh, now or in 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 destructive or deep disempowering causal contexts so if the if you are not able to hear me it could be because i have pressed the mute button it could be because you have pressed the mute button it could be because the internet transmission is poor it could be because zoom has been hacked and somebody doesn't want this conversation to go on so there uh, it could be that because all over the world people are using the internet so much because of the social distancing that the internet itself has crashed you hope so you could escalate the causal boxes to various levels and when we see karma as one level of a causal explanation not the sole explanation then we can when when then when we are facing a problem we can act in a multi pronged way including considering the karma way so it's not, so we do need to work at social distancing we need to increase the human immunity so for example taking certain substances like ginger or vitamin c or whatever can help increase our body's immunity so we act at multiple levels and one level which would be implied by karma if at all we want to consider what can we learn from it is that we have taken the environment for granted and we we have been we humans in the last few generation last few centuries uh, have gone about living as if or uh, living on the planet as if if we just have the power to do what we want to do we can do it and we are not accountable for it if we consider <clears throat> in most traditions across the world whenever there would be any kind of violence inflicted say uh, or involving killing say the in the vedic tradition if animals would be killed there would be a yagya there would be fire sacrifice some kind of sacrifice and then the meat would be eaten if we consider the judaic judaic tradition there is the whole their concept of the kosher food in islam there is the hal concept of the halal and the haram so the idea if you consider the 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 mau the maori tradition so they would have certain animals which they would eat but they would understand that by that violence they they are disrupting forces bigger than themselves and they would regulate they would They, they would sanctify it in some way they would have the rituals of sanctification so indiscriminate violence uh was not the uh, there was some regulations on killing other forms of life but that kind of discrimination that kind of regulation has completely been lost in today's society and we are not just in terms of killing animals yes we are killing millions and millions of animals every day in fact if we consider that all all the livestock that is killed and all the farm fish and the natural fish that are killed uh, every day we are killing about 1/4 of the human population every day 2 billion life forms are being killed by us humans so the there is certainly something which we are doing which uh, which has never been done in human history at this scale in fact there's one thinker who said that if the animal kingdom formed a religion and they wanted to depict satan they would depict satan as a human being that is because not only have we killed so many animals but we have created fast factory farms where we are killing them in in extremely brutal ways causing uh, unconscionable amount of pain amount amounts of pain to them so now we may not at our level of perception be able to see how our decreasing the killing of animals 
is going to decrease the probability of pandemics like this happening. But that is just because we don't understand the exact le multiple levels of causation that are causing this. Uh, so for example, somebody who has no understanding of microbes, they may, uh, in today's world, they may say that, okay, if I hug a person whom I love, uh, what does that got to do with some pandemic that originated in China? Mm -hmm. Or if somebody is, uh, <clears throat> if say there is a big building with a lot of, mm, lot of load shedding happening over there, lot of power being used, and somebody does, you know, if if you turn on this one switch, or uh, the whole electric grid system will collapse. Say, what? This is just one tiny switch over here. And how will the whole electric system collapse by that? So it also requires a certain level of knowledge to perceive certain causal connections. So karma, the Bhagavad Gita itself says is karma is gahana gati. It's extremely difficult to understand. So what we do understand is that there are certain courses of action which will lead to constructive results and certain courses of action should lead to destructive results. And this is not so much in terms of a, 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 a moral condemnation as a functional evaluation. That a functional evaluation, if we compare the history of humanity, as compared to the past, certainly we are causing far more bloodshed than others, other than in the past human history. And if you consider maybe in the last 60, 70 years after the Second World War, there has been far less, far less uh, deaths because of wars, but proportionate or simultaneously, the amount of systematized animal slaughter has increased substantially. So if you consider from the overall perspective of human history and the multi-level causal uh, conceptions, then maybe this is a reasonable inference that is worth considering that by decreasing the animal slaughter, we will be playing a less disruptive role in nature and thus nature may subject us to less disruptions in return. Uh, I wanted to add one thing to, to what you just said, bringing the science angle until maybe 1960s or something, um, people thought that causation is fluke in science. Only correlation is meaningful. If you relate to quantities and their numbers change simultaneously, then, then it makes sense to say that A may cause B. It was only very recently that a priest of correlation his name is uh, Judia Pearl. He is actually father of Daniel Pearl, who was, I think, assassinated or sort of held captive and then he died, Daniel Pearl in Pakistan. So Judia Pearl is his father, he's a UCLA professor, and he started this field of causation. And now it's a mantra in all the learning learning uh, learning data, learning schools, etc. that causation is not correlation. Causation is much different from correlation. Two things may go here up and down, but there may not be any causal links. And particularly this becomes problematic when there are hidden variables, what we call the unobservables or the latent variables. Mm. So, so, and he has written a book, popular book, which if anybody is interested, he can read called the, the Book of Why. So it's a new science of causality. He, so given this viewpoint from science who are struggling hard to even grapple with causation. I mean, there are, uh, there are actually camps. They say causation is all fluke. And this is, these are Pearson. You know, Pearson is a very famous name in probability. He was, his camp says that, okay, causality is, doesn't, doesn't hold ground. And there is this new ground who is saying that 
know for causation causation you need sophisticated math to even reason out causality and this was the whole war about uh, which causes cancer i mean does cancer result into smoking or smoking result into cancer maybe both are going up and down so are they correlated or there is a causation link so this was this whole debate and he uh, takes this issue in a scientific manner why i am bringing this point that now we can imagine the complex situation of the world where there is these big unobservables which are beyond our perception beyond the temporal scales beyond the geographical scales so i think at this point what point you meant is a uh, very pertinent that air air to be safe in the sense give benefit of doubt that these situations may be possible at least we can try out at least we can try out going meatless to a few days instead of eating seven days non vegetarian maybe try out meatless mondays religiously and see the effect so 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 yeah the causation problem is actually a lot more complicated uh, it's it's a uh, very uh, even in plain vanilla science it's very disputed and complicated and uh, now uh, in fact ai they call it it's actually basic rung it's it's uh, it, it, they are just mimicking what the humans do they are just hard coding the machines to do for ai to become like humans they have to add causal reasoning which means they have to argue the counterfactual if this didn't happen what would have been the result so this question so we can ask that counterfactual question if we didn't you know there is this last ending of a movie called contagion in which they show that they are clearing up the forest the bats pick up a banana come and hang up in a pig sty then the pig eats up the banana and that goes to a person who is cooking the pork he doesn't clean his hands and he shakes hand with a business magnet she becomes the index case day day 1 so so maybe we can ask these counterfactual questions if we didn't clear the forest where they there was no need then could it be something different so yeah what this was my thought and if you had some views on it that's a you know this is, it's a good point that causality even in science is difficult to establish mm. so there is a there is a paper published i think in the 1930s if i'm not mistaken or maybe a little later, but before around 1950s that when the it became clear that smokers were having lots of lung problems so there was a scientist who later found was funded by the tobacco industry and he proposed that there is some gene which makes people inclined to smoke and makes them vulnerable to uh, lung diseases mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so he tried to there was a, instead of inferring the obvious causal connection that smoking was causing cancer he tried to bring a third fact and said that was the cause and this is simply a correlation Mm -hmm. so now of course that was um, as they say sometimes einstein said that science is a great thing as long as you don't have to earn a living from it so <clears throat> there can be there are certain places where we could make reasonable causal connections and we could say there's simply correlations but it would be better if we we adopt the attitude of humility and see if we can empower ourselves by certain healthier choices mm -hmm. so so if in science causality is so difficult to infer but we don't wait for absolutely definitive results mm -hmm. uh, before we move forward in uh, certain directions we do we do wait for reasonable inferences but if we start waiting for waiting for the rest of eternity in fact all of inductive reasoning is based on a reasonable conclusion not a definitive conclusion mm. so uh, so it would be a reasonable conclusion to consider even if we can't establish a precise causal connection mm. it's a reasonable working hypothesis or a working uh, inference 
to move forward and see if causing less disruption of nature leads to less disruption by nature for us mm. yes okay so shaman you want to add something uh, no i just have something coming up i have some calls to attend so should we we can have the continue discussion or just, uh, yeah maybe you want to want to summarize up what we broadly discussed any carry home points or something we started ad by discussing about karma as a is karma a tenable causal causal explanation and then i discussed about how cause effect connections are universal there is a moral and a functional aspect to it and as long as I, the bhagavad gita uses karma in, in a sense of the present to future not past to present and then you talk about how if there is a divine being that divine being is not not vindictive is more like a, a person who is giving in a court somebody who is in a court who is going to do what, who, based on the actions the reactions are given and as we talk about the same principle how the world is in some ways causally complete and uh, we can infer actions is different causal contexts so karma could be one causal context that we can consider even if there's no definitive conclusion of it but it could be a reasonable inference which you can take to maybe make healthier choices in terms of causing less disruption to the nature and maybe that will lead to less disruption by nature any other points i missed out i think these were great summary yeah okay okay so it is wonderful being here thank you thank you thank you everybody